Well, probably about a week ago or so, um, right whenever I woke up, I was, I was already thinking about uh, a scripture verse, and, and I wasn't even studying on it or anything like that. And, but just the second that I woke up, this, this scenario was running through my head, and it was Matthew 16, 23. You can feel free to turn there if you'd like, because that's pretty much where we're going to be most of the morning. Um, but have you ever woken up and like something was just already there? And what's interesting is I wasn't, I wasn't in a study on Matthew 16 or anything like that. So it wasn't just something that, that was just in my head because subconsciously I had already been thinking about it. So that's how I knew that, that the Lord was trying to speak to me. Well, Matthew 16, 23 says, But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Now, if you, if you think about that whole scenario, you can understand why that was a little confusing to me that I woke up and that was the first thing that was running through my head. And I'm like, God, what, what are you trying to say here? And he said directly to me in such a sweet and loving way, he said, get out of the way. And I'm like, out of the way of what? <laughs> you know, like I'm clueless here, God, you know me. You're going to have to give me a little more than that. <laughs> so, he was telling me, what he was telling me was to get myself out of the way of what he wanted to do through me. He wanted me to get myself out of the way of what he wants to do through me, of what he intends to do through me. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, help us to get out of the way. Amen. All right. So, naturally, if you hear something directly from God, you want to get in and study it a little bit more, especially if he doesn't give you this, this clear revelation of what it is that he's talking about whenever he speaks a phrase to you like that. And so I jumped into Matthew 16, 21, and we're going to go through 21 through 25. Because really, like I've said before, in order to understand the content of what you're talking about, you have to take it into context and you have, to, you have to see what's going on in this whole situation. So I, I naturally wanted to know, why did Jesus personally speak out to one of his absolute best friends on earth and call him Satan to his face? So I'm like, all right, let's, let's check this out. Apparently Peter needed to get out of the way. And if Peter needs to get out of the way and God's telling me to get out of the way, then... I want to I break this down. I want to figure this out. So in Matthew 16, 21, I'm going to read all the way through 25. Fortunately, it's long, not very long. But um, it says, From that time, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to, su or for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and to be killed, and to be raised on the third day. That was necessary. And yet Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, 
For you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but on men's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is an amazing passage of Scripture right here. There's so much that lies just in these few verses that hold our purposes and plans for us. It's kind of a roadmap for what God wants to do with us. All of us have different callings. Your calling's different than mine, mine's different than hers, so on and so forth. We all have different callings, but whatever the calling is, this is the roadmap. Brings me to point number one. Sometimes suffering is necessary. We don't want to suffer. We most definitely don't want the people that we love to suffer, right? So we don't even want to believe that suffering is necessary. We don't even want to allow that to enter into our thought process. However, sometimes it's necessary. And I can say this because Jesus specifically spoke it out. 1621, Jesus began to point out. He began to make it clear. Now, at this point in time, Jesus had already told his disciples multiple times that he was going to have to suffer. He told them in different ways at different times throughout his ministry, but it wasn't so direct. This is absolutely finite, clear. Jesus spoke it out and said that it was necessary for him to suffer many things and to be killed and be raised on the third day. He's laying this out for them, telling them what's getting ready to happen. And finally, well, first of all, if he didn't suffer and he wasn't killed, he couldn't be raised. And neither could we. We've got to clearly grasp and understand what happened, what Jesus did, what he had to go through so that we could benefit from it. Jesus also benefited from it. But all of mankind, me, you, every single one of us benefited from what Jesus did. You might say, yeah, but that was just for Jesus. You know, Jesus was the one that had to suffer. That was Jesus. He doesn't want us to suffer. Well, you know what? He doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't want you to. But sometimes it's necessary and it's going to have to happen. But think about this. Jesus is suffering. Even though none of us wanted him to have to do it, it was a benefit for us. And sometimes benefiting, we benefit whenever we suffer. But we don't want to. We want to control it. We want to try to avoid that suffering as much as absolutely possible. But beauty comes out of the refining fire. Things get hardened. Steel gets hardened whenever it has to go through the refining fire. So do we. We come out better whenever we do have to suffer. There's a uh, Japanese samurai that in some of his writings, he says, if you have a choice to suffer or to not suffer, choose suffering every single time because through that, it brings character. And, and the Word specifically talks about that too. So, whenever we think that, that it was just Jesus that had to suffer and, and that it wasn't us, we have to then step down a couple verses at Matthew 16, 24. And Jesus says, Then Jesus says to his disciples, If anyone wants to come after me, if anyone wants, wants to come after me. He's indicating that you can, anybody can, if you want to. But you must 
deny yourself. He says he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. What is this cross that Jesus is talking about? Like I said, we have to put it, we have to put the context of what he's saying, or the content of what he's saying into context. Guys, back then, Jesus is only hours, literally, away. You can count the time in hours away from when he's getting ready to go to the cross. The cross was a very prominent figure of absolute torture and death then. It was suffering. And Jesus right here says that if we want to follow him, we must pick up our cross and follow after him. Where was he going? In order to follow somebody, they lead, you follow, right? He knew what he was doing, what he was getting ready to do. But he knew that the outcome would be phenomenal for everybody. And the outcome for us, if we're following Jesus and we're taking on the things, we're denying our own flesh and our own desires, and we're taking on this, this suffering for the Lord's sake, many, many, many people are going to benefit from that. Does anybody benefit from us being selfish? No. The fact is, even I don't benefit when I'm being selfish. That's the absolute stone cold fact. I don't benefit when I'm being selfish. If you know somebody that, that or if you have ever struggled with like um, uh, depression or, or, or anything like that, and, and they're struggling real hard, they're struggling because they're focused inward. But then, this simple task, my brother was telling me one time that, um, that he started to try to help these guys that were in this um, uh, program that he was going through. And whenever he was helping them, he flourished. I mean, flourished. It's the same thing with me. Whenever I'm suffering and I'm struggling with something, if I turn my focus outward and try to help other people, I'm not focused on my own stuff. It doesn't make that big of a difference what I'm going through, you know, because I'm purposefully trying to help other people. It's, it's, it's just as real as the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. It's just that real. If you're focused out and helping other people, you will be the one that gets blessed. You will be the one that gets blessed. Jesus says, for whoever wants to save their own life, save their own life, what, what else that could mean is, or be their own Lord, saving themselves by their own wisdom and knowledge and ability, will lose the very lives that they're so desperately trying to hang on to. Think about that. But, Jesus says, whoever, whoever, there's that whoever again. I love the whoever because it, it includes all of us. Whoever wants to, Whoever knowingly and willingly releases and lets go of or loses their obsession of trying to control every aspect of their own life, for my sake, Jesus says, for my sake, if you let go of the control over your own life for my sake, they will find their true life. That is how you find your true life the life that God has for you, the meaning that God has for your life. That is how you find it. So oftentimes whenever I'm studying something and I come across words, I'm like, I, I really want to break this. I want to break these words down. Sometimes they jump off the page and like kick me in the face like Chuck Norris or something, you know? And it's like, okay, let's look at this. Let's look at this. Thank goodness Chuck Norris didn't kick me in the face. But for my sake... And I wanted to determine what that truly means. And, and sake right there means for the purpose of, in the interest of, or in order to achieve or preserve something. So Jesus is saying, if you lose your life in order to preserve me on this earth, in order to take me forward, in order for, for my best interest, you'll find your life. That's what he's talking about. That is so encouraging. And this promise, you know, have you ever, 
literally tried to, you're hearing something, but your mind picks out all the negative in it. I've found myself doing that as a parent. Like, I, I want my kids to, to grow up and have all the best things. I want them to be able to, to receive blessing upon blessing. And, and in my own human mind, I feel like that if I, if I pinpoint the negative, oh, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Don't, you can't do that. that. That by me telling them what they can't do is going to produce something better. But in fact, that's just simply not the case. And I still do it, and I still have to go in and apologize to them all the time, unfortunately. But if we look at this, if we read it and we break it down with the promises and the encouragement that Jesus is actually laying out here, it's not you can't do this. It's not you can't live your own life. It's if you do this, if you let it go, you're going to truly be blessed. That's where you're truly going to find the blessing and the favor of my Father God raining down on you if you let go. It's not that we aren't going to have needs. And it's not that we don't think about the needs. We're still going to have needs. And you may still think about the needs a little bit. The difference is, is that God's going to provide for those needs. That's the difference. You don't have to provide for them. It's like a husband and wife. If I focus on Brittany and her wants and her needs and her desires, then she focuses on my wants, my needs, and my desires because I'm meeting all of her needs, wants, and desires. She doesn't have to. And I don't have to focus on mine because she's naturally taking care of my needs, wants, and desires willingly, happily doing it. And that's literally what our Father God wants to do. If we focus on Him, He's going to take care and provide for all of our needs. Fortunately, it's according to His riches and His glory, not our own. Thank you, Jesus. So, that leads me to point number two. This has been something that I've been learning my entire life, and if my mom was here, you'd get a big amen. It is think before you speak. I'm surprised. My wife didn't give a big amen, but, but in her mind, I promise you, I promise you it was the loudest amen ever. Because oftentimes, we go places, and I meet new people, well, I like to like walk on the, on the edge. You know, I like to walk that fine line. And uh, so I'll say things to get a reaction out of people to see if I'm dealing with a fuddy-duddy or if I'm dealing with somebody that can handle my personality. Well, I say something and Brittany's like, she's just looking at him like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then later she's like, Nathan, you crossed the line. I'm like, I didn't see a line. So... But I will tell you, that's got me in a ton of trouble over my lifetime. And just like Peter here, I need to think before I speak. Peter should have thought before he spoke. But look, let's look at this. If you've got your Bible open, Matthew 16, 22. I love how it starts out. It says, and yet. Jesus said this stuff. And yet, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the literal Son of God. And yet, Peter takes him. It says, Peter took him. I'm serious. I looked it up, uh, I looked it up in the Greek, and it literally says that Peter took him. It's like, it's like if, you, if you need to talk to somebody, they're saying something, and you're like, hold up, homie. And like you grab him by the arm, you're like, come here, I need to tell you something. You're way off base. Well, that's what Peter did here. He took Jesus. <laughs> he took Jesus, and then it says he took him aside and began to rebuke him. What's interesting here, though, is we're reading this in Matthew. You can also read it in Mark, which means Peter didn't take him very far. Because everybody heard it. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody heard what he was saying. Peter, you know, he wants to get his point across. He begins to rebuke Jesus. He says, God forbid it. And in, in many other translations, it says, God be merciful to you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Jesus just says, this is what I'm going to do. Peter's been with Jesus for about three and a half years almost right now, at this point. He's seen everything that Jesus has done. Everything. He's one of Jesus' absolute best friends. In fact, the conversation that Jesus just had with Peter, right before this, I mean right before this, Jesus says, you are Peter, Petra. Your name means rock, and on you I will build my church. That's how powerful Peter was. That's how faithful Peter was. That's how much Jesus loved Peter and could trust Peter. But you know, whenever he said that, Peter had to have been going, wow, how, okay. I'm hoping that this isn't the case, but this is my own speculation. Maybe Peter was thinking, then I must be, I must, I must have it together. You know what I mean? If Jesus is saying he's going to build his church on me, I must kind of have it together. Maybe that statement, that, that conversation right before this kind of empowered Peter to think, you know what? I do have the right to pull you aside, Jesus, and tell you that you don't, you're not thinking this through. Maybe. But Peter takes him aside, and it, you can tell that Peter has a good heart here. Peter's heart is really, you would think, in the right place. To us, it sounds like his heart is in the right place. He's saying he doesn't want something bad to happen to his best friend that he loves more than anything, and he swears I'll lay my life down for you. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. Have you ever not wanted something bad to happen to somebody that you love? So much so that you are willing to intervene? We look at what Peter's doing here, and we're like, wow, man. How can you rebuke Jesus? Have any of you, like me, ever argued with the plan that Jesus had for you? He tells you to do something, and you're like, oh, crap, no. Uh-uh. Uh, no, you know, I don't think that's going to work out really good for me because all these reasons. Well, Jesus knows what's going to work out for you. Peter, Peter rebukes him. So the rebuke, you hear the word rebuke a lot. And... I know what it means, but it's another one of those words. Chuck Norris, yeah, kick me in the face with it. I'm like, I want to I get down to the bottom. Of, I know you want to see the whole thing, Scott. One of the, you know what, after service, I'll show you. But um, I wanted to get down to the root of it. So what the term rebuke means here, what Peter did when he took Jesus to the side was express sharp, disapproval or criticism of someone because of their behavior or actions. Sharp disapproval or criticism. That's the definition of that term. Peter is sharply disapproving of and criticizing what Jesus says is necessary to happen. So now it's a little bit easier to understand whenever Jesus looks his best friend in the face, and says, get behind me, Satan. He uses the word Satan. Now think about this. Peter's not Satan. We know this. Jesus knew this. Jesus had an intimate relationship with Satan. He created him as Lucifer to be the most amazing, wonderful, beautiful angel in heaven that was in charge over all of the worship in heaven. Jesus knew Satan. Jesus also cast him out of heaven like lightning. He knew Satan. Three years earlier, he was tempted in the wilderness in his lowest human point before the crucifixion. He was tempted by Satan, knew him on a personal level. So he knew his attributes. He knew the kinds of things that, that 
Satan did, the kinds of lies that he tries to twist up the truth with, the kind of seeds of doubt that he does. And Satan had sown a seed of doubt in Peter's mind. He was whispering a little lie in Peter's ear, and Peter was believing it. Jesus says, you are a stumbling block to me. Peter wasn't a stumbling block to him, per se. Satan was. Jesus was speaking to Satan. The Word does say, here in Matthew and in Mark, both of the documented accounts of this, he looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. He's speaking to Satan's attributes. He's speaking to Satan. He knows that Satan is, is trying to influence Peter's actions here. We're like, man, Satan trying to influence Peter's actions? Satan has influenced a whole lot of my actions. I'm just going to be real with you. He has. He's pretty stinking good at it because he knows us. He says, though, here's what Jesus says. For you are not setting your mind. You, you personally, are not setting your mind on God's interests, on what God wants to do, on what God plans to do. You're only looking at the natural. You're only seeing what's going to happen right here in the flesh. But that isn't what matters. That's not the point. What happens to me, Jesus is saying, what happens to this body is not the point. It goes so much farther than that. He's saying you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Who in here knows that God's ways are higher than our ways? And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. If you can put God in a box, in a cute little box, and wrap him up, and he only does the things that you understand, then he's not God. If you understand everything that, that your God does, then you're not seeing the real God. Because he goes so much farther than anything that you can think or imagine. That your mind could possibly wrap around. Right now, we only see in part, but then we will see in full. But it's not until we actually ditch these bodies and we get to heaven, we get to see him face to face and hug on him and sit on his lap. I mean, I can't wait for that time. I don't want to leave you guys like anytime soon, but if I do get to, then so be it. Say bye. You know, I mean, literally. Where, we're, where I'm going, I, I guarantee you where I'm going. I know, I've got the guarantee, and it's going to be better than it is here. But Peter was only looking at that. He's only looking at what Jesus just said in the natural. He's only taking it at face value, like he's not looking any deeper. But, Romans 12, 2. You can turn there if you want, you don't have to. You can put it in your notes. It says, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. What did Jesus just say here? He said, you're not setting your mind on God's interest. And in Romans it says, do not be conformed to the basic simpleness of this world. Don't accept this world for what you see. This isn't, all, this isn't the absolute reality. The absolute reality is the spirit that we live in, the spirit world, where we're going after this. That is the absolute truth, and we must renew our minds. We must be transformed. We've got to transform our thinking to not just see this basic, simple stuff, to not just see pain and suffering of the physical kind, because it's just a second. It's a breath. It's here today and gone tomorrow. No big deal. We've got to focus on what lasts forever. So, Jesus tells him that he's being a stumbling block to him. He's being a stumbling block to him. Why would Jesus say that he's being a stumbling block to him? Because he's a good friend of his. Jesus, we know that he doesn't want to go to the cross. We know that he truly doesn't want to because he knows it's going to be painful. We know this beyond the shadow of a doubt because he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if you can take this from me, take it from me. 
So if you don't want to do something and your best friend is sitting here saying, no, dude, absolutely not. We're not doing that. I'm not going to let you. You're not thinking clearly. It's going to be hindering to you. It's going to be, you know what? You're right. I don't want to do this. Especially if you're about to go through what Jesus knows he's getting ready to go through. It's not just having a hard conversation with somebody. That's not what he's going through. And Peter is, is saying, no, dude, no, you can't go. That's why Jesus tells Peter, you're being a stumbling block to me. This is hard enough as it is. Don't be a stumbling block to me. Don't give in. But we can be a stumbling block to God's plans in our own lives. Or even in the lives of those that we love and we don't want to see hurt. If we're not setting our minds on the things of God and on what his overall purposes could be, if we're running off at the mouth before we think about it and before we pray and ask God, God, is this your purpose? Is this your plan? Are you okay with so-and-so going through this? Are you okay with me going through it? Because I don't want to speak out something against your plans. I don't want to give it power. The Word says that there's power of life and death in your tongue. We've got to start understanding that. We've got to start grasping the fact that when we speak out, we are created beings created in the image and in the likeness of God, and God spoke and the world was formed. He said, let there be light, and there was light. If we're created in His image and likeness, and He speaks out and things are formed, when we speak out, things are going to be formed, or they're going to be destroyed. That's the power that lies in our tongue. So have we ever been a stumbling block to the plans that God has for our lives or somebody else's that we loved? Maybe suffering is necessary and we do everything that we can to avoid it. But maybe we shouldn't. So right now, Peter, he was speaking out of fear. He was speaking out of fear. One, he wanted a Messiah to come. The Messiah that, was, that they believed was going to come and take over the government, overthrow the Roman government. That was what he was thinking, and he didn't want Jesus to have to go through all this suffering. He just wanted him to take over as king. But fear is not from God. Fear is from Satan. It's from Satan. That's why Jesus was rightfully speaking to Satan because Satan was trying to destroy God's plans that he had just heard. He heard Jesus speak out the plans of God. He was right there listening. You think he left Jesus' side? You think he just went away? You think he left the disciples that were Jesus' followers that were going to come after him? They were going to prepare all of us to be able to still hear the name of Jesus over 2,000 years later? No. Satan knew what was up. He met him in the wilderness. He knew who Jesus was. He's not going to leave him and give up an opportunity to be able to destroy God's plans. And then he hears Jesus speaking out, it's necessary that I suffer. It's necessary that I die. So then he's like, oh, well, my plan was to kill this dude. Now he's saying he's going to suffer and die. i got to change things up a little bit. So then he gets into Peter's head to try to be a stumbling block. So that's why Jesus was specifically speaking to Satan at that point in time and trying to get Peter's attention. Look, think about what you're saying. Brittany and I, we were discussing this message the other day. And um, she told me a phrase, and it was similar to this. It probably wasn't verbatim because my memory only lasts so long. I did get up and try to get paper and start scribbling stuff down because she starts saying stuff. Half this message was stuff she was saying. So <laughs> that's why we're one, though, right? Like God, God gave me her because he knew I was really weak in most areas of my life. He's like, I'm going to give you this lady that's going to make you look good. So thank you, Jesus. But don't give Satan a foothold by speaking out the lies that Satan whispers in your ears. Don't speak it out. Don't come into agreement 
with what Satan is speaking to you. Don't come into agreement and give it a foothold by speaking that stuff out especially without taking it to God first, without asking him and lining it up against the word of God. Don't speak it out. Don't let it come out of your mouth. I was listening to uh, this song this morning and it's the, uh, the new wine song. Jesus make new wine out of me. But one of the lyrics in the song is, when we trust him, we don't need to understand. When we trust Him, we don't need to understand. We think we need to, though, don't we? Aren't we certain that we need to understand in order for it to be God working in our lives? I bet there was a lot of times Peter didn't understand. Like when he was getting beat pretty much to death while he's floating around out in the middle of the sea. I bet a lot of the disciples didn't understand when they were being martyred for their faith, when they were giving up their lives, brutally tortured and getting their heads cut off or crucified upside down. I bet they didn't understand everything at that point. But what they did understand is whatever they went through, they were not going to turn their back on their Savior. No matter what, they were going to love Him and proclaim Him even to the death. And God built his church on them. God's still building his church and he's building it on each one of you. You are foundational in making sure that the future knows and hears the name of Jesus because people are trying to shut it down big time right now. Big time. And you have to make the decision in your heart that no matter what, no matter what, you will not deny his name. You will choose him over your own comfort. Because you know what? It can be uncomfortable following him for now. But we get to go to paradise for the rest of eternity. So back to the tongue. James 1.19 says, Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That was what hung Peter up. He was quick to speak. But this says, be slow to speak. I'd venture to say James may have had a little bit of Peter in mind whenever he wrote that. You know, be quick to hear and slow to speak, Peter. <laughs> or he could say, Nathan. James 3.8 says, No human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. And that sounds like, well, psh, why should I even try? Why should I even attempt to tame the tongue? If James says... No human being can tame it. Here's why. Because in Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, out of Jesus' own mouth, He says, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. That one phrase right there shuts down every argument that we've ever had, saying, I can't do it. Saying it's going to be impossible. Even James says a human being can't tame the tongue. You're right. And James was absolutely right. You can't. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. This stems from the conversation that he was having with his disciples after the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what can I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, sell everything and follow me. And the dude's like, oh, I can't do that. And then his disciples are talking to him. And Jesus says, a rich man cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, this is not possible. A rich man can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. And James says, a human being can't tame their own tongue. People stop after they hear, a rich man can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so did the disciples because they said, then who can enter into the kingdom of heaven? 
because we have all this stuff. We're rich in our own eyes. Who can enter? And God said, Jesus said, you know what? You're right, it's totally impossible. You can't, but, but with me, everything is possible. No holds barred. You can do anything. That's why I love Jesus. He's so encouraging. He tells you, he forms this situation that the world says is absolutely impossible. And then he says, but hang tight. You still have me. He tells them to go to the upper room and wait. And the helper's going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And he's going to rest on you. And he's going to work in you and through you. And there's not going to be anything that you can't accomplish with him. We've got to hold on to that. That's what we have to fix our minds on. The things of God. What can we do with God's help? Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It doesn't stop whenever it says I can do all things. Because you can't do all things. You can only do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That's it. That's absolutely it. I want to touch on one thing real quick, and then we'll close. Jesus also says in John 8, 32, he says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the truth. I am the truth. If you want to know truth, don't go to CNN. Don't go to Fox. Don't go to Google. If you want to know the truth, I am truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is who I am. He says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Peter knew the truth. Peter knew Jesus intimately, but he still had lessons to learn. We know Jesus we have a relationship with him, but we still have lessons to learn. We're not going to outgrow God, ever. But he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Fix your eyes on me. Seek my face. These are the things that he's telling us. And then we will know the truth. And the truth will set us free. Jesus is our truth. So in closing, I want to ask you a question. Truly, truly think about this. Think about this. What is God wanting to do through you that you're standing in the way of right now? What are you believing that doesn't line up with God's word. Just like Peter, what has Satan been whispering in your ear that doesn't line up with what God's word says about you, about who you are, who you're created to be? What is God wanting to do through you that you're standing in the way of right now? I want to encourage everyone to truly go home, get in your quiet place, and start asking God. God, is there something that you've been trying to accomplish in me, to me, through me, that like Peter, I've been rebuking you for? And please help me to have the strength and the ability through the power of your Holy Spirit to remove fear from my life and step forward and do what it is that you're calling me to do.
If anyone wants prayer, we'll be up here to pray. I do strongly encourage you to come up and get prayer if you have anything that you need or want prayer for. If you know anybody that needs prayer, that needs a move of God in their life, no matter what it is, physical, spiritual, emotional, healing, restoration, a deeper relationship with God. If you're saying right now, I need a deeper relationship with God. Don't be afraid. Get prayer. Get prayer. Because prayer works. 